and girls for a special patreon edition of the michael deacon program joining me in a moment is mr mike siegel he in fact is a true legend in broadcasting and i am honored and privileged to have him here on the program and talk with us here for a very exclusive interview you won't hear anywhere else now without further ado let's bring in mr mike siegel i'm doing great how are you today I'm fantastic. Thanks for asking. I'm so glad you're here, and I do want to thank you for spending a little bit of your time with us here, and it's great to finally get you on the show. Pleasure to be here. It's a fascinating subject, and it's always interesting to talk about. It's uh, one of those things that has no end in sight. It's uh, all these mysteries that come up that it, it's, uh, it gives us an opportunity to really explore the universe, literally. It really does. And most people out there, I, well, I shouldn't say most people, but a lot of people out there do know you from your tenure over at uh, Coast to Coast AM. I thought you could talk to us a little bit about that since, you know, to be honest with you, Mike, there's not that much information about that time period. Well, the uh, Coast to Coast was uh, really an education for me as much as it was for the audience because one of the ways in which that show developed is having expert guests in the field of uh, extraterrestrials, the universe, uh, black holes, wormholes, time travel, just the whole realm of these unique mysteries. And because there are no absolute answers, it was always developing programs that would be uh, thought-provoking. Kind of the idea that... Uh, you have people listening. Of course, it's an overnight show, so you have people listening overnight. And then they're listening to these, what appear to be, strange stories. But then when, when the uh, end of the show happens, as one of my producers once said, a couple is lying in bed listening to the program, and then at the end of the program, the husband turns to the wife and says, no, nah, that can't be. And then a minute later, he turns around and says, but what if? And that's what you, what the show creates is the what if, and uh, so many tantalizing discussions about issues of these phenomena that uh, it's it's a never-ending discussion, and so that's the beauty of that format, and it gave me an opportunity to really learn that in this field there are so many highly educated scholars who uh, have investigated various aspects of uh, whether it's space travel, time travel, uh, alien uh, visitations here, um, the whole realm of these things, remote viewing, and uh, it's just fascinating. So I, uh, it was fascinating to me, and that's essential in order for it to be fascinating to the audience, because if you're not really fascinated and into and passionately care about this, then why should the audience? And so it's... Uh, it's, it's really a, a connection with the audience that makes it work. You know, I'm so glad you said that. We're jumping around a little bit here, but there's nothing wrong with that because there, there's so many things to ask you about that. And yes, sir. And one thing you just mentioned there that I find uh, very fascinating is the fact that you said you have to be interested in the subject that you are talking about. And that's actually one complaint that you hear time and time again about George Nori, and, and there's nothing, I'm not saying this in a disrespectful manner by any means, and I, you know, I know George, we are on good terms here, but that's one criticism that he seems to get quite a lot of. Well, I don't want to get into 
criticisms of others. Correct. I'll yes. only say this, that uh, when I was doing Coast to Coast, he was uh, he asked me to do fill-in for me when I was not on the program for a, for a given night. And he did that, and that led to his getting the program. So I feel like I've basically laid out the red carpet for him to take the program and uh, and that's that's where it is and uh, but I'll leave it at that I don't want to uh, right really get into judging other hosts yeah we're uh, not going to judge him and uh, by by any means and yes interesting enough both of you have um, broadcasted out of Seattle and that's kind of where you were mostly known for uh, in the conservative political field that's true uh, if you want to get into that, we can certainly get into that as well. It's, sure. Uh, I did a book uh, called Airing the Wave, which is still available um, uh, online. And um, it, it covers many of the campaigns we did on the political side, on public policy side. Now, I can get into the, to that, too. I don't know if you want to stick to the issues of uh, uh, mysteries of the universe, as I like to call it. Or if you want to get into the politics, but I'm happy to do either or both. A little bit of both, because again, there's not that much information about how you sort of came on to coast and your exit from coast. No one really has any information about that. And I thought people would just love to hear that. And the internet believes that Art Bell picked you specifically for, for the for the gig. Is that not true? Well, it turned out that I was uh called by the Vice President uh, Alan Corbett, who was handling the uh, Coast to Coast show for Premier Radio Networks, and um, he asked me about filling in, so I did. And then the president of the company, Craig Kitchen, liked what he heard, and uh, ultimately I uh, flew down to Los Angeles and met with him at his office, and we set up my doing the program, and uh, it went from there. And at that time, it was interesting because Art had gone through a terrible situation in his family. His son, and he talked about this publicly. Yes, he did. His, his son was uh, abused by a teacher. Yeah. And Art chose to, to his credit, take some time off and deal with his personal family issues. And um, then ultimately, he came back after everything was resolved in his personal life. And I understood that because he had created the show. It was very interesting. The way he described it to me was that he was doing politics and then he just decided and told Alan Corbett, the, the uh, producer of the program, let's get into some of these other areas. And they, they got into the coast to coast format and um, being the, um, discussion of uh, all of these issues that we've been describing here, the uh, issues of aliens and, uh, again, time travel, space travel, um, uh, anomalies that we find, abductions of people, um, remote viewing, uh, astral projection, you know, all of that. And because he was getting bored with politics, which sure. I think a lot of people are. So... Uh, that the show just took off because there's a major audience for that format and for that program, and so uh, when he was when he developed it, it became very popular, as you know, it became a huge success. And then when he left, I took over the program, and then when he chose to come back, uh, I fully understood that because it was his program to begin with, and so he when he went back and took over the program. And the rest is history. And so uh, that's how the whole thing evolved. And then I went on to do other uh, programs on the political side. Uh, and I'm right now very seriously pursuing the idea of developing a podcast and then maybe a syndicated program uh, for in this field, in this genre of coast to coast, because I think I have a lot to offer and I would want to do that uh, with an audience that, uh, as you pointed out, still remembers my hosting of Coast to Coast at the time. Absolutely. People do remember you, but again, there's not that much information about about you specifically in your time there. So again, 
people are going to really enjoy this uh, interview here with you. The fact that you get to sort of clear the air in a way. And again, speaking of criticisms, uh, Mike, you, you were no stranger to criticism on Coast to Coast AM, but the thing that people need to remember and you specifically remember should re uh, sort of have in mind is that was our show and anyone they put up there, his fans are never going to truly embrace them, in other words. You know, it's very interesting you say that because I learned that. And what I did was to uh, take from the audience its feedback. Uh, in fact, I had a uh, fax machine that the listeners could, could use the fax number to fax me whatever they chose to fax because you couldn't get through on the program unless right. you were fortunate because the lines were always full. So people who couldn't get through on the lines still might want to give input. And so we had a fax number that I, where I had the machine that uh, they were able to send me messages. And I remember one time having uh, a gentleman on from Philadelphia who had done time travel. He had gone back in time to an earlier period. Uh, in fact, he uh, talked about having met Tesla, the, who the car is named for, uh, the great scientist who was really a, a kind of a colleague of Einstein's. And uh, so I asked him some questions about it, and I got some faxes from people who were indignant, saying, don't ask him questions, let him talk, because they didn't want to have to have the guest justify what they were saying. They just wanted to hear the stories. And I learned from that, and that's how we developed the program from that point, was that just let the story unfold and don't judge it and let the audience decide for itself ah, yes. what it believes and what it doesn't believe. And I, I, I learned a great deal from that thanks to the audience. Right. Absolutely. It's good to get that listener feedback. But of course, not only was there criticism, but there was also praise for you. And I, I remember way back in, uh, it must have been 2003, when you actually did, I think for the very first time, a sort of in-studio guest, I believe it was. I think you might have been talking about Bigfoot, if I recall. Yeah, we did that. And, uh, uh, of course, Bigfoot was a, was a popular part of all this. Oh, yes. And uh, of the whole subject. And so that came up periodically. Uh, Chupacabra came up. Uh, all of those different elements of those kinds of programs came up. And in different ways and different times, which is the beauty of the format, uh, because you're not limited. If something new comes up, uh, we used to, the, the production staff was absolutely superb on that program because they knew and understood how to develop the issues and the formats and the discussions. And we could go into something brand new if it was an idea that sounded like it would work. And I would spend I remember spending several hours each afternoon. Uh, in fact, I'd go to a local Starbucks and just sit there with my computer and go through the particular guests we were having that night and uh, their issues and their discussion. And um, that would be a way for me to prepare. And that's how I learned about the issues involved. But it sometimes would be, as I said, something brand new. Whereas in politics, it sounds like it's always the same old, same old, which is why it gets old and dusty, whereas this subject is always fascinating and always new if you really pursue the different elements that come up about this subject. Even recently with the uh, fact that the government has sort of released information, they've released some videos about uh, alien visitations and things like that, or, or spacious ships that were unidentified that they're acknowledging. Now, they haven't fully done that as of now, but at least there's some movement in that direction. So when something new happens, this is a field that is ready and prepared to talk about it. And I would always make prepare myself the best I could to make sure that we got into some really good conversations. And we, the one you're talking about was one of those. That was that a great show, really by the way. Well, I appreciate that. And by the way, um, the other part of that 
is that I used to attend conferences uh, on the weekends in preparation for the show. I, we would, I went to, uh, I remember it was in Colorado to an abduction weekend seminar where people who had been abducted would get together and they would actually show me the uh, implants that would be put in their bodies when they were abducted. The actual, almost like a GPS. Uh, and oh, yeah. back in those days, GPS wasn't as well known as it is now. Now you get in your car and you punch in the address you're going to, and the, and the voice tells you how to get there. Well, this was a similar kind of uh, monitoring of the person with GPS. We have it now for our pets. You can put a chip into the uh, pet and find out on your computer where it is if it's if it gets lost or if it, you can't find your pet or the cat that's in your office there. So um, it was something that uh, I would attend and really get great interviews set up for the show during the week. I went to one on remote viewing, uh, which was fascinating because they would have uh, sheriffs speak at the um, at this remote viewing seminar. And they would talk about uh, using people who could do remote viewing, finding children who had been abducted. I remember one sheriff who actually was able to solve a case because of someone who was skilled at remote viewing. And we found out that the military uses it, that the uh, KGB in Russia actually used it at the time. And then because we had to keep up with them, we started doing it. So uh, this, this, these phenomena that seem uh, extreme or science fiction actually are science and are being used by very credible mainstream organizations. And, right. Uh, and it's been fascinating to be able to, to see that. It really has been. And especially today, which is pretty wild in, in the year 2024, when these topics of yesteryear in the early 2000s, they were very taboo at the time. And now it's sort of become the regular. How do you feel about that, Mike? I think I think that, well, that, that's been the case throughout my career and what I've done, because I've always, even, even in the political arena, brought up issues that were not quite mainstream yet. And then all of a sudden would be uh, validated by situations that would come up subsequently. And, uh, and, and so people would want to turn to the program that I was doing because they, would, they felt that they would get some cutting edge material that would later become mainstream. So I'm very used to that. And in the field of uh, what we're talking about with uh, abductions and remote viewing and uh, astral projection and all of this, it's become much more mainstream. Now, all of a sudden, people talk about it as if it's commonplace. And we, as you well know now, Michael, the fact is that uh, something like 58% of the public believe we have had alien visitations. Right. So it isn't something that's uh, you know out there in, a, in, in some minority, bizarre view. It's a very mainstream view that we, we, we realize that this universe isn't monopolized by only the Earth, that there are other planets, other galaxies, other, other elements within the universe where there is life, and people believe that we've had advanced life visit us to the tune of well over half the population. So it's a subject that has enormous uh, interest and consequence. Absolutely. It has an enormous pool and reach, and of course, your time on C-SPAN. Also, I, I went down the, the, the proverbial deep dive and listened to uh, numerous shows from yesteryear. And uh, I got to say, Mike, you were damn good, and you still are quite good, I imagine. Well, I'd like to think so. I think you uh, are, yes. You know, it's the old story. It's, it's, if you maintain the... the uh, issues and the talent and the presence and the continuing of doing the work. Uh, and really, you, you know, the key to any, any success in any field is continuity, consistency, and always being open to growth, change, and progress. I have never stood pat thinking, well, I'm, I've accomplished this, this, and this, so it, that's okay. That's not the way it works. Because if you want to remain successful, 
you have to treat every program every single day as uh, the next new venture. And you have to, you're only as good as your last program. The old cliche. I strongly agree. So, yes. You know, so that's uh, something that's really, really important is to be relevant and to uh, deliver to the audience uh, fascinating subjects that make it worth their while to listen. You, you have to, you have to earn their attention, and that's one way to do it: is keeping it relevant and prime. Right, and of course, you earn the respect of your peers and fellow broadcasters like Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly. They all speak very highly of you. Well, I've always appreciated that, and you know, it's a kind of a small community, right, uh, in the broadcast field, as you know, and um, and so people get to know each other. Uh, in fact, I, I you mentioned. O'Reilly, he uh, had me on some of his programs, and he came on my program. He wanted to come on my program when he came to Seattle. Oh, nice! Promoting his his book when I was on the air in Seattle doing the local program, and uh, then we had a case of a an individual who had been abusing children. He was working with the Scouts and had access to children, oh. and was was involved in abusing them. And so O'Reilly, I mentioned it to O'Reilly when he was in Seattle. He wanted, and he, to his credit, he came back to cover it. And we did cover it. And why the, the political leaders were not dealing with this, because we were covering it on the air regularly as to what this guy was doing to these children. It turned out that we were in the end successful, and the guy got uh, 28 years behind bars because of what he had been doing with regard to the uh, abuse of these children. And so uh, Bill O'Reilly had a lot to do with that, and uh, I really appreciated it. And it, uh, it made it satisfying that we got results, and that's one of the things. The thing that's different about the coast-to-coast -coast format right. versus a political format is that with the political format, my whole uh, approach was taking problems facing the public and trying to get a solution for them. We, for example, stopped the 51% pay raise in Congress, which was uh, obnoxious. I mean, the American people were struggling, and why should Congress, members of Congress, get a 51% pay raise? So we stopped that. We were able to uh, get the laws changed about uh, tankers carrying oil by having double hull tankers because of a campaign we did after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, I could go through a litany of all of those things, but th we were getting results, is my point. With with um, mysteries of the universe, you're not dealing with getting results. You're dealing with investigating all aspects of these fascinating subjects that are universal and that we don't have any answers to. So you're not looking for solutions. You're looking just to uh, investigate and give people insights into various aspects of those issues. And it made it quite fascinating for me to see the differences between those two approaches as I developed those kinds of programs. Oh, yeah. That must have been quite interesting to jump into both subjects during that time when things were so oh. heavily politicized like they are today. I mean, it's no different, really, to be honest with you. I mean, I watch movies from the past and I watch TV from the past and it's all the same talking points, to be honest with you. I, I often wonder, Mike, what year am I living in? Well, you know, if you watch, uh, I'm a big movie buff also, and I watch a lot of the TCM network, which uh -huh. is uh, the classic films from yeah. the 40s and 30s. And you can see that it's a whole different era. The films today are special effects. In other words, you have the animated films, Despicable Me, I guess, is a huge film. Despicable Me 4, a lot of uh, advertising they're doing for that and the animated type films. In the old days, it was much more about relationships, love stories, military uh, films, westerns, um, with with actual human contact, and and the, and the focus was on the human relationships in the context of whatever whatever the genre was. Whereas now, you just have a spectacular special effects film. And uh, you're going to be doing very well. You'll get plenty of response from uh, success at the at the box office. Because if you look at the films now, they're not 
anywhere near the same caliber in terms of storytelling exactly as yes. they were previously i so, agree with you a hundred percent i mean today's movies the the, the ending of every movie today is just awful. It seems like writers don't know how to close the show properly. I think that's a valid point. That's a very interesting observation. And uh, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's changed a great deal. And, I, and as I think it was Steven Spielberg said, that the, the target really now is young people, teenagers. Right. That's, that's the target audience. I would imagine uh, so. I would so imagine so. Started. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you have to keep in mind that today everyone seems to have ADD. So the normal attention span for most adults now is about 30 seconds, which is why commercials are about that, that length. Isn't that something? It's crazy, you, you Mike. Just, you just said, well, you know, uh, what, what, what's, what's, uh, but see, the difference on the format of Mysteries of the Universe or Coast to Coast, Yeah. Uh, that format is much more, and I remember when I hosted that program, much more laid back, much more let it slowly unfold, let the guests talk about the expertise they have in the field that they're discussing, and you let it unfold slowly. Nowadays, you're absolutely right. It's because of texting, uh, chat, email, Instagram, uh, that people have these abbreviated very quick hit conversations and that gets reflected in the media that come out nowadays. It's a, it's a very different um, approach and it's a very different time frame uh, for, for, for developing a conversation or communication today as compared to say 20 or 30 or 40 years ago because Absolutely. you didn't have texting or right. any of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big difference nowadays. And speaking of which, um, in terms of uh, politics and your views, um, after all these years, have you changed any of your political views, my friend? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, let me say it this way. Uh, when I was a teenager, I got into being interested in politics because of John Kennedy. And uh, hmm, okay. I, just, I just really gravitated toward his presentation, his style, and the issues he talked about. It was just um, a real connection for me. And he was very charismatic and brought the country to a very excited, more youthful level. And uh, that, that position, that growth of the issues that he discussed and the positions that he took stuck with me. So I always answer this question by saying, I didn't really change. The country changed. Because today, John Kennedy, with his positions on issues, would be a conservative. Or at, at, at least a moderate Republican. As opposed to what he was then as a Democrat. Yeah, I, a good, yeah. good example of that is Joe Lieberman, the senator from Connecticut, who was a moderate and who ran in a primary for re-election against a left-wing uh, Democrat who beat him in the primary. And then Joe Lieberman ran in the general election in Connecticut for the Senate and won as an independent. So the Democrat Party went much further to the left over the years. So George McGovern oh, yeah. did that. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten even more so now. And so... Though I was a Democrat back then, I'm not any longer. I'm, I don't have, I don't define myself by party affiliation. It's a bit different. I define You're, myself yeah. by, by, by issues, by, by what I believe. I agree. And, uh, and you know, so that's, that's how it's changed. So I haven't, I don't believe I've changed a great deal. I believe the country has changed a great deal. And people who were Democrats back then wouldn't fit the bill today. They right. wouldn't be successful today. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, uh, times have changed, and it's the country that's changed. Uh, the Democrats during uh, Clinton's run, for a great example, are not the same Democrats that we have today by far. It's a pretty crazy difference. It's night and day, actually. And furthermore, I just got to ask you, what do you make of RFK Jr.? I find him fascinating. Uh, I, I find him fascinating because he's not the 
rubber stamp stereotyped Democrat. Of course, his family had a legacy of the Democrat Party, and his father really was the one who was the intellectual driving force for the family. He was very influential in getting uh, his brother John Kennedy as president involved in the Dr. Martin Luther King jailing and burning him, Alabama, and, uh, and convinced his brother John to get involved in that uh, in that situation uh, for the civil rights movement. And uh, so you would think that Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, would be in the same framework, but actually he has severely criticized uh, the policies regarding COVID-19, as you know, uh, that that they were a fraud on the American people. Right. And he's taken very different positions. Uh, he hasn't, for whatever reason, he hasn't caught on the way he might have. But stay tuned because who knows if he might not be asked by Trump to run as vice president. With him. You never know. Yeah, you don't know. No one truly knows. And I'm sure you watched that very uh, strange debate. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was pretty that wild. Was, you know, I don't agree with uh, Joe Biden on almost anything. But um, during that debate, I was embarrassed for him. I, same here. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, in other words, if he had his full force of mental faculties and he was the full force and his full energy on the issues that he supports, I would have been much more uh, antagonistic toward toward his position, as I would be with anyone whose policies I disagree with. But it wasn't about that. It was about his inability to articulate a coherent sentence. And how do you have a president of the United States inarticulate uh, in, in office or in a debate for, for the re-election to the presidency? It's, it's frightening, and it's scary, and it's um, something that I feel sorry for him about, that he doesn't even realize how much he lacks the ability uh, mentally to be president, putting aside his positions on issues. And allegedly he had 8 million votes, by the way. Well, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, who had 8 million votes? Uh, Biden, allegedly. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not sure how. That's a whole but, other story. Yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> thing. And, you know, I, I do go down the conspiracy rabbit hole for sure all the time here on the program. And right. I just feel that it, it's, it's a big political masquerade. Well, the, the, the Democrats now are really in a dilemma. Uh, look, people chose Biden the last time because there, there wasn't much uh, in the alternative in the Democrat primaries. Uh, he had at least experience as vice president, so people figured uh, he, he had experience. Let's, uh, let's vote for him. And uh, now we've seen the catastrophe of that with the inflation and uh, uh, Putin going into Ukraine. Many would argue that if Trump were still there, you wouldn't have had these wars. You wouldn't have had this inflation. You would have had energy independence continue in this country. Uh, all of those things. And uh, so the Democrats envelop themselves around Biden, but then now they have uh, panic because they don't see how he can win. And there's a lot of talk about how to get him out and get somebody else in. But I've, I've, that's really fascinating because the primaries have already been run uh, for the most part. And uh, if, uh, all of them, basically. So how are you going to uh, get somebody else in as the candidate who didn't run in the primaries and who you're going to maybe nominate at the Democratic convention in place of Biden, and then they only have a couple of months to try to make the case to the American people. It's going to be very fascinating to watch this whole situation and whether Biden actually does run in the final analysis. Yes, it's quite an interesting time in the political world. But going back to just, uh, just last year, at a contact in the desert, my friend, I randomly ran into you in the media room. Yes, and, you did. Oh, yes. And I was quite surprised to see you there. I had no idea I would find you out in the wild, Mike. Well, it was, 
I've, I've, it's a very interesting situation. We, I, I was there with uh, the person who's going to be my producer for this new uh, program called Mysteries of the Universe. And uh, we trademarked the name and everything. And um, as it turned out, uh, we got some great interviews that we did at that contact in the desert, which is a, for those listening who uh, are into the field of uh, exploring the universe and these mysteries, uh, that's something to attend. It's in California. It's a phenomenal event. It's the biggest event of its kind in the country. And uh, you have several thousand people there congregating all together on these same subjects. And you, know, you have uh, seminars and meetings and uh, meeting like-minded people. It's really rewarding. But we did this uh, series of interviews, and we were going to use that as the, as the jumping off point for the podcast. And then my producer, who's a brilliant producer, uh, had a, an accident and uh, had medical problems that are still ongoing and she's unable to really get full blown into doing the, this work. She's having to deal with her medical issues, which are pretty serious uh, injuries and uh, oh it still hasn't been resolved. So it delayed the program. Yeah. And now uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, redeveloping the program and getting it out on the airwaves. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, speaking of uh, the past again here, um, have you listened to uh, Coast to Coast AM at all? Uh, sporadically, not very often, but uh, occasionally, but not not as I uh, used to when I when I when I hosted it. Obviously, I was obviously, yes. in the middle of it. Do you but, ever uh, do you ever get the urge, like if you listen to that show, do you ever feel like, oh, I would do this, I would maybe go this way or that route, or Say this instead of that. Do you, does that ever cross your mind? Oh, sure. I mean, I have my own style of, of questioning. I like to, uh, you know, I've, I've in, the, in the many years I've been in broadcasting, I've, I've worked very hard at honing my skills as an interviewer. And um, I take great pride in that craft of being able to do interviews. And I find it frustrating that there are so many out there, again, because of the 10-second soundbite that you were talking about, oh, because yeah. there's not time to develop. With the, with, and with the luxury of, of this format is there's time to develop the conversation. In most other formats, there is no time to develop it. Uh, if you look at TV and uh, Fox News or CNN or uh, MSNBC or any of them, uh, they're just quick hits without much in-depth discussion right because you don't have the time it's uh uh television just has so much else going on and um radio also has gotten that way for the most part except that in this format uh you're able to do that and then develop it more fully but yes when i when i listen to other hosts i know what i say why don't you ask this question why don't you ask it this way um and and you know, the key thing is making an open-ended, open-ended question, uh, and and letting that person fill in the blanks, mm. and then whatever they don't fill in, then you follow up with the follow-up question. The other thing that um, I've noticed is that the hosts, and, and, and I'm not naming any particular hosts, yeah. some hosts in any of the radio format, talk radio format, um, do not really listen to the answers because they've already got their next question lined up. So the next question may be something very different than what the answer was to the previous question from the guest. And what I would like to do and when I, when I do the programs is to feed off of the answer and to, to get to the next question uh -huh. rather than have a predetermined question. Right. If you have predetermined questions, then it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Yeah. It doesn't really, well. it doesn't flow. No. And it's too clinical. And it doesn't get you the result you want, which is getting to know that person uh, very effectively. And so I think uh, the um, the ability to feed off of the answer from the guest is crucial. And when I've listened, I've heard that that is sometimes not the case, that they don't feed off of the answer from the guest because I, you know, I trust myself. 
and I think, I think some people may not trust themselves to, to, to get into asking the questions in the way I'm describing it.